I'm truly blessed to be able to be with you tonight. Your presence as well. We know there are many things you could be doing on a night like this, and we're very honored that you've come to be a part of this. I want to ask a sobering question as we begin tonight. 25 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, who's going to be leading this congregation? Who's going to be preaching in this pulpit, serving as a shepherd, one of the shepherds in the congregation who are going to be the deacons, the Bible class teachers, the ones who are doing the things, all the things that are being done now by the older folks, who's going to be doing that 25 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, if the Lord lingers, who's going to be taking care of all of that here at this place? I'm aware of the fact that some of the younger people who are represented here tonight are not going to perhaps be living here in this town in 25 years or 30 or 40 or 50. Are you going to be attending services somewhere 25 years from now, young people? If so, where? And will you be still teaching that we ought to have a thus saith the Lord for everything that we say, do, teach, or practice? Will you still be teaching the plan of salvation that's taught in the book of Acts? Will you still be teaching generations to come how we ought to worship God in the manner in which he's directed in the New Testament? And will you still be emphasizing that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3.17? Will you still be saying, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 11. I will you. What will you be teaching about the home 25, 30, 40, 50 years from now? Now, it's sometimes hard for young people to think that far ahead because they're so wrapped up in the here and the now. But listen, the Bible gives us a lot of teaching about children and their role, both here and in the future. And we want to, children to be able to go from the here to the hereafter in such a way as to be successful, eternally successful. You know, it's very possible for a young person to graduate at the top of their class, valedictorian, salutatorian, I mean high academic achievement, nothing wrong with that. Parents and grandparents absolutely glow at uh, such accomplishments, yes, But you know it's possible to be all of those things and to still be lost on the day of judgment. It's possible to have the highest paying job in the county and to still be lost on the day of judgment. And so, young people, I'm asking you, what are your values? What do you treasure? What do you cherish? And what if your phone somehow were no longer to be available to you? Could you find happiness in life? Could you find contentment in this, on this planet? You know, we've talked a little bit about how the screen time has gone up and up and up and up for so many of these devices. And I know that this can be a challenge and that all of us are uh, going to face it. I remember some years ago, I got my mother a Kindle for Mother's Day so that she could read books on it. And as she was preparing lunch that day after the Sunday morning service, All of us were sitting around waiting and we were scrolling on our devices and looking at news and sports and things of that nature. And uh, she didn't often do this, but she went on a little tirade about people and their devices. People and their devices. Everyone's looking at a screen somewhere. Everyone's looking at a screen. And I'm thinking, oh no, I just bought her a screen for her Mother's Day present. This is going to be interesting. As it turned out, when we gave the gifts, my son was sitting there with her, showing her how to set it up, and she got so enraptured and lost in what she was doing, we were all saying, Mom, 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 and then when we finally got her attention, I said, these people and their devices, wouldn't you agree? And so all of us can relate to this 
There is fortunately an old-fashioned way of reading and learning things, and what's so precious about this is not the fact that it's in a leather-bound, you know, volume. It's, it's the words, the words that God breathed out that still are needed today and that young people need to listen to today. So young people, what does God want you to know? He wants you to know that he expects for you to obey your parents and that this is for your benefit. Let me show you this in the Word of God. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Now, we're not under the Ten Commandments today, I'm aware, but the principles that are found in the Ten Commandments are certainly interesting to observe, and nine of those Ten Commandments that were given in the Old Testament law of Moses do find a place in the New Testament, only in a different a covenant but still, God does not expect people to do the things in this covenant that they were forbidden to do in the previous covenant. And he does expect us to do something under the New Testament that uh, they were expected to do under the Old as well. And notice Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you find uh, basically a reiteration of that. Moses is preaching a series of farewell sermons, and he has something for the young people to listen to as well. Moses wasn't just preaching to the older folks. He was preaching to the younger folks as well. And he told them in Deuteronomy 5.16, Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God has commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And so God wants young people to obey their parents. Is that just an Old Testament concept? I want you to please listen to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Ephesians 6 and verse 1 is written to New Testament Christians and what does it enjoin upon children? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then the text goes on to say, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Well, what is the promise? That it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Question. Are there some graveyards we could visit tonight within a 60-mile radius of this building where young people are buried because they didn't listen to the warnings their mom and dad gave them? I'm afraid so. And I want to make sure that we don't populate more of those graves and grave sites in time to come because we're not listening to the wisdom of good parents. In the book of Proverbs chapter 1, you find a plea given to young people, and I want to echo that plea tonight. Proverbs chapter 1, and look at verse number 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Why not? They shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. Why would someone wear something to adorn their head or to go around their neck? It's to adorn them and to make themselves look even more attractive. And one of the most attractive things you could ever do, one of the most attractive things you could ever wear is the good teaching that mom and dad gave you and to take it with you and to never let it depart from you. He says here in verse number 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Don't go along with them. He says, if they say, come with us. Let's lay wait for blood. Let's lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let's swallow them up alive as the grave. We'll all find precious substance, verse 13. We'll fill our houses with spoil. Come on, cast your lot in among us. We'll all have one purse and we'll split the purse. What does the father say to his son about such a proposal? My son, verse 15 of Proverbs 1. 
Walk not thou in the way with them. In fact, refrain thy foot from their path. Don't even get near these kinds of folks, for their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed blood. And so it's so important for us to listen to the call of wisdom. Wisdom's crying out to us here in Proverbs 1, saying, Listen to me, follow me, follow my path. And instead of the foolish woman that is described in Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 7 and parts of Proverbs 2, saying, Hey, follow me, and I'll take you. I'll take you to places that uh, God doesn't want you to go because he knows how pleasurable they are. Do you know the devil's modus operandi has not changed since the Garden of Eden? And it's all summed up in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, young people. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that is in the world, like what? He talks about these things. He says the lust of the flesh, that's what would taste good. The lust of the eyes, that's what looks good. And the pride of life, that's what would make me look good. Now go back to the Garden of Eden. He said, and that's not of the Father, that's of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. But go back with me to the garden for just a moment, and let's consider, Eve, what do you see? I see something that's pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And a tree to, that would be good for food, there's the lust of the flesh. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, there's the pride of life. That would make me look, I would be like God if I ate of this tree, the devil wants her to believe. And she listens to the enticements of the devil after having been given a perfect training course by the best father in the whole wide world and beyond. Listen, Adam and Eve were as well trained as any children ever have been in the history of of the world. Who taught Adam and Eve right from wrong? Almighty God. Did he spend enough time with them? Sure. Did he educate them sufficiently? Absolutely. So did that mean Satan had no shot with them? This is what I'd like to stand here and tell you, that you have a 100% guarantee that if you just teach your children the right thing, they will never, ever, ever go astray. They can't. It's impossible for them to go astray. If I teach you that, I'm teaching you something that goes beyond what the Bible teaches. Because God taught Adam and Eve, and they went beyond what they were taught. And as free moral agents, Eve and Adam both did not follow God's directions, His commands, they follow their own willful way, children. You can be well taught. Maybe you are here tonight or listening to this over the means of a recording, the internet or some other means. You could be the most well taught individual in your neighborhood when it comes to what's right and what's wrong biblically. But your job is not done. Now what? Now what do you need to do now that you're well taught? Go with me to Proverbs 4, if you will, please. Proverbs chapter 4, and I'm going to date myself a little bit with this, but uh, I, some of you old timers and those who are uh, relatively older will really know how to fill in the blank for what I'm about to say. And I'm not asking you to say it necessarily, but I think, I'm, I think you'll get it when E.F. Hutton talks. You know the rest, most of you, and a good number of you know the rest. What? People listen. The commercial would show people having conversations at lunch and various places, and then E.F. Hutton talks. And suddenly everyone is, you can hear a pin drop. But why? E.F. Hutton is about to drop some wisdom on these people. He's about to drop some knowledge on them that is going to educate them in the, in the area of stocks and bonds like no one ever could. And oh, they want to hear what he has to say because he is a renowned expert. Listen, when parents talk, what's the job of the child? Listen. 
In fact, look at Proverbs 4.1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Now look at what the father says. I give you good doctrine. Now once I've given it to you, then what? Look at the last phrase. Because this is where I must confess that I, as a preacher, I think failed in my early years of preaching to balance out some things. I preached a whole lot of sermons to parents about what their obligations were, and I should have. And I still should, as we did last night. But I didn't preach near as many sermons on the child's obligation after they've been well taught. And that's what Proverbs 4 is all about. So you've been given good doctrine. Verse 2 of Proverbs 4, now what? Forsake you not my law. Once you've been given this good teaching, don't forsake it. Don't leave it. I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Verse 4, he taught me also. And then said what? Now that I've taught you, let thine heart retain thy my commandments. Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. So it's not enough to hear what your parents are saying and let it go in one ear and right out the other. It's amazing how smart mom and dad get when you get older and have your own children. I re remember very vividly my dad visiting our house after we'd had children. They were small at the time, but old enough to know better about something that I was talking to them regarding. And I gave them a very impassioned message. And as soon as they walked out of the room, my dad literally fell off the couch laughing on the floor. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, I've heard that speech before. I've given that speech before. In fact, I didn't think you were listening when I gave that speech, but apparently you were because you basically just repeated it word for word. Ah, at the time, I'm sure that he gave me that speech. I didn't have the same regard for it that I would have later on when I got my own chance to try to raise children and to try to impact them with things they needed to remember. Suddenly all those things I thought my mom and dad were clueless about in my youth, I realized I was the one who didn't know and understand what was going on. And so what does the Proverbs writer say in chapter four and verse five? Young people, whatever you do, whatever you get, get wisdom. Get understanding, and once you get it, don't forget it. He says, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Now, don't ever walk away or try to get further away from the good teaching that you've received. I saw a poster when I was just a boy in the Sunday school hallway, and it's still to this day, I can picture it, where it was on the wall, and I still remember what it said, what it read. If you're not as close to God as you used to be, who moved? Yeah. And what is this passage saying? Neither decline from the words of my mouth. If mom and dad have taught us manners, if they've taught us right from wrong, if they've taught us yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and thank you, no thank you, etc. If they've taught us holy behavior, good behavior, then we don't ever need to let that decline. That's something that we get further away from. We need to incline rather than recline, incline rather than decline from those words. Those words need to be precious to us. And I can promise you this, there are some folks in this room tonight who are older who would tell you things their mom and dad said that they cherish to this very night. They remember. At the time their parents said it, they may not have even realized what an impact they were making. And I can promise you, there are things your parents are teaching you that are going to be so much more valuable as time goes by, if the Lord lingers, than you even realize now. What does he say in verse 6? Forsake her not, 
She shall preserve thee. You want to be preserved? Yet follow the teaching, the good teaching you've received. In fact, love her rather than being hateful about, oh, here we go again with you telling me what to do or what not to do. How about an attitude of respect that says, okay, I, I may not understand or even agree with this at my young age, but I owe you the respect to hear you out on it and to follow you because you have been around longer than I have and you have studied this book longer than I have, and you know what God said, and I need to have more confidence in you. And notice, if you will, verse 7, what's the principal thing you could ever teach a child to get? Wisdom. Verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, and therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding, exalt wisdom, and she'll promote you, he says in verse 8. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. But if you reject her, then you're going to be on the outside looking in at success rather than the other way around. And notice verse 10. Son, are you listening? Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. Where have we heard that before? Exodus Honor thy father and my, thy mother that it may be well with thee and you may live long upon the earth. That's not a 100% guarantee that no young person doing the right thing will ever die, but it is to suggest that the general rule is that you follow the teaching of your parents, you'll live longer than those who don't follow good teaching. He goes on to say in verse 11, I have taught thee. Yes, I've done my job, now it's your job to do what? I've taught thee in the way of wisdom. I've led thee in the right path. Did God teach Adam and Eve the way of wisdom and lead them in the right path? He did. Now what? Verse number 13. Take fast hold of instruction, and once you get a grip on it, let her not go. This is the Proverbs 23, 23 way of saying, buy the truth and sell it not. Once you get it, you don't ever give it up. You are so absolutely determined to hold fast to the good teaching you've got, never to let it go. Keep her. She is your life. And so consequently, that means you won't, verse 14, enter into the path of the wicked. We're going back to where he was in chapter 1. If sinners entice thee, saying, come with us, you don't consent and say, okay, I want to be considered in with this group, so I'll do things that I shouldn't do. Listen, I'm not going to tell you that I'm proud of what I'm about to tell you. And fortunately, it wasn't a long spell, but even a short spell is wrong when it comes to what I'm about to describe. There was a time in high school when I remember deliberately acting contrary to good teaching that my mom and dad had given me because I thought that was my ticket to be accepted by certain people at school whose respect I, for some reason, coveted. I remember one night being in my bed in Indiana. Thunderstorm came rolling through our town rattled the windows on that house. That house shook that night, and I shook in my bed. And I thought to myself, I have not been talking like my mom and dad taught me to talk. I've not been walking like they taught me to walk when it comes to spiritual things. No, I've been walking after the pattern of my worldly friends, friends in, in quotation marks. They were not really true friends as friends are described in scripture no and so here I was and I remember very vividly praying and I remember saying this to God in that prayer father please I'm so sorry for the way that I've departed from what I've been taught and the way I've been living forgive me for that and then I remember this and let me when I wake up if I wake in the morning have this same conviction I have now, even when the storm is past and the sun is still shining. It's easy when you're in the midst of a storm to start promising everything to God. But God deserves our obedience and our respect when the sun is shining every bit as much as he does when the storm is coming. 
and he wants us to love him for all the right reasons. And uh, those reasons are not just because I'm terrified right now. Those reasons are, look what he did for me. And my mom and dad loved me and taught me. And so what should I do? I should take fast hold of what they've taught and never let it go. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Now let me pause right here and ask something. For those who take Proverbs 22, 6 too far and act like almost it's a once saved, always saved passage that if you just train up a child in the way they should go, they won't depart from it. It's a 100% guarantee it cannot happen. Okay, does, does Proverbs 4 describe a child being taught the right things? Yes. They're given the right wisdom. They're given the right instruction. They're told, don't get with this group. But what does verse 14 show the writer, led by the Holy Spirit, understands it might be possible for that well-taught child to do? To walk away from the good teaching they received and to act contrary to it, just like Adam and Eve acted contrary to the good teaching they received. And I want to show you a passage in the book of Ezekiel that ought to sober us up when it comes to this subject right here and the role of parent and child. Parents have to live a good life before their children, teach them the right things, yes, but then what does the child have the responsibility to do? Imitate that. Let me give you an example in Ezekiel 18, beginning at verse number 5. Ezekiel 18 and verse 5. Look at the man that's described here beginning in verse 5. But if a man be, what kind of man are we talking about? Just. And do that which is lawful and right. This is a good man. He's not eating upon the mountains. He's not, what's wrong with eating up in the mountains? This is a reference to things they would do in worship to idols. The context shows that. He has not gone up to engage in idolatrous worship and actions that would be involved in worshiping idols. He hasn't defiled his neighbor's wife. He hasn't violated the law of Moses and its laws concerning cleanness and uncleanness. Look at verse 7. He hasn't oppressed anyone. He's restored to the debtor his pledge. He's, if he's made a, a financial commitment, he keeps it. He has spoiled none by violence, verse 7. He is a compassionate man. He gives his bread to the hungry, and if somebody's lacking clothing, he, he covers them up with a garment. He doesn't charge this interest that's described in verse 8. Neither has he taken any increase. He has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and he's executed true judgment between man and man. And look at verse 9. What kind of man is the man we've been reading about? He has walked in my statutes, has kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Would you agree that the man we just read about was a righteous man? Watch the next verse. If he, the man we just read about, the righteous man we just read about, who was all about living for God and being righteous, if that same man begets a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but is even eaten upon the mountains. He's defiled his neighbor's wife. You go back and read the description of his father's righteousness, and this son is the exact opposite of his father. He is unrighteous in every department where his father was righteous. Now, how did that happen? He had a good dad, a righteous father for sure. And someone might say, well, but you know, maybe the mom was not good. Listen, there are passages of Scripture that we're going to show you in just a moment that show the mom can be perfect in her teachings as far as what's right and what's wrong. Let me just give you an example by going to John 7. 
Mary, you're going to have Jesus. The Holy Spirit's going to work a miracle in you to make you become a mother, and you're going to then give birth to Jesus, and you will be a virgin when that happens. I want you to notice in John chapter 7, we learn that later on, after Jesus was born, Matthew 13 shows this as well, there were brothers and sisters that were born to Mary, that Jesus had half-brothers, he had half-sisters, he had individuals that had the same mom, but not the same biological father. So Jesus in John 7 is approached by his brethren, his half-brothers. And look at what they said. We know the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Verse 2 tells us as much. His brethren, his half-brothers, therefore said to him, Depart hence, go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. There's no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show thyself to the world. And reading it in that tone, it might seem like what an encouraging band of brothers Jesus was fortunate to have. But read verse 5. For neither... Literally, not even did his brethren believe in him. May I ask you who raised these boys? Mary did. Mary, do you not know who Jesus is? Oh, yes, I know who he is. If anyone knows who he is, I know. Did you not try to impart the identity of Jesus to your other children? I'm sure that she did. I'm sure that God would not have selected her to be the mother of Jesus if she wasn't a good and godly young woman. So Mary, why do Jesus' brothers not believe in him? That is an obvious proof that you are a failure as a parent. Really? We want to go that far with that? Now, here's good news. We know later on James and Jude, at least, came to believe in Jesus and would even write inspired books about the church of our Lord Jesus Christ and give instructions to those who were members of the Lord's church. And this is a lesson for those of us who are parents who may be in pain. Don't give up too soon. Just because your children's current level of belief is not where you would like for it to be. It's not where you taught them it should be does not mean that they could never come to where they ought to be because even though in John 7 and verse 5, James and Jude were not at the level of belief they needed to be, they later would become that. So parents, we don't give up. We don't give up. And let me ask you to go back now to an Old Testament example and let's talk about, let's talk about Joseph. I actually sat in a, an auditorium some years ago and heard a preacher that I know meant well. He meant well, but oh, what he was saying was so illogical. He was standing up there saying to all of the parents gathered, if your child can't pass the Joseph test, then you failed as a parent, and you failed the test of being a good parent. What is the Joseph test? It is Joseph at age 17 being sold into slavery, and then when Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph, he makes the right decision. He says, how can I do this great wickedness against God? He's morally pure, and so because Joseph is morally pure, his father was a fantastic father, and if your child can't pass the Joseph test, you're not a good father. I wanted to shout from my seat, but it would not have been orderly. Who raised the boys that sold Joseph into slavery? Who raised those boys? Who, who was their daddy? The same man... Raised Joseph, 
raise those boys. And I, we cannot pick and choose and act like, well, in one case, this proves they're a good father and the same parent may have, as I described last night, children sometimes, or multiple children belong to the same two parents and sometimes one or more of those children are faithful while another or more are not. And they were raised by the same parents who taught both children or all children the same values. It comes down to free moral agency in Proverbs 4. Go back with me to Proverbs 4 and notice, if you will, please, what this passage is telling young people. Young people, if you were taught well, fantastic. Now what's your job? Hold on to that. Don't ever let it go. Enter not into the path of the wicked, verse 14. Don't even go in the way of evil men. In fact, it says, avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. This is why we have described, many of us preachers have described Psalm 1 and the progression that's described there. The ungodly versus the righteous. The righteous man does not walk in the way of the ungodly. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. So he doesn't walk. He doesn't sit. He doesn't stand. He doesn't walk. He doesn't stand. doesn't sit. There's your progression. So picture this. If there is a place that you know is going to be a temptation to you, whether it's a website or a certain app on your phone, and you know, I need to avoid that site altogether because when I haven't done that in the past, when I've not just absolutely avoided it, it usually leads to me looking at things I shouldn't be looking at. So don't think that you can just kind of uh, glance, but not... No, no. He says there are times when you just have to avoid it altogether. You don't try to even be in the vicinity of it because here's what ends up happening. In Psalm 1, he's first depicted as walking by. And then he's depicted as standing. He's not walking any longer. He's standing. And then he's depicted as sitting. He went from walking by it to standing and gazing to sitting and participating. And young people, I'm begging you, please, if you know there are certain places you shouldn't visit on your phone or certain uh, programs you shouldn't be watching, even if mom and dad don't know you're watching them. And parents, that is, again, back to us. We've got to be clued in to what's going on in our children's lives entertainment-wise. And we can't just hope for the best. We've got to know what's going on so that they're not being led astray by things that are wrong. In verse number 20 of Proverbs 4, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear. Notice, incline. Recline is back away. Incline is to, like, I want, now what did you say? I really want to hear that. That's the attitude children need to have with teaching from mom and dad, not, you know, please, whatever. It is, what did you say? I want to hear it. He says in verse number 22, uh, verse 21, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep it front and center. Right and keep them in the midst of your heart. They are life to those that find them, health to all their flesh. Guard your heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. He says you need to put away from you the kind of tongue, uh, mouth, speaking uh, that would be perverse. Perverse lips, you get put that far away from you. You don't need to be talking like that. And don't let your eyes get distracted by Satan's billboards inviting you to come over and check this out and inviting you to come over and check this out. No, let your eyes look right on, verse 25, let thine eyelids look straight before thee. I always think when I read this passage, 
about driving on the interstate where they have those concrete barriers and a small lane and an 18-wheeler on the other side of me. There are all kinds of billboards and scenery to look at. I'm not doing it. I've got my eyes focused straight on. I'm keeping between the lines. It's not time to sightsee. It's dangerous. And you and I have an obligation to get find out where God's lanes are and stay in the lane. And do not get off at the nearest exit to dabble in Satan's temptations because they will bite you like a serpent. Alcohol is one of those things, young people. Don't, don't mess with it. It's not going to be your friend. It's going to hurt you. How many people do you think woke up one day and said, you know what I think I'm going to do today? Become an alcoholic. It doesn't happen that way. It happens over time. And then it's like, what? Well, I'm enslaved to this stuff, whether it's alcohol or whether it is some other form of substance abuse. This is not the life that God wanted for you, intended for you. Whatever you're addicted to, whether it's the internet or social media or caring what people think about you that don't even know you, care more about God and what he did for you rather than what people who don't know you think about you. Now, as we start closing out, I want to go to 2 Timothy 3. There's a thread that we've been emphasizing here, and that's continuation. You get good teaching, then what do you do? You take it and you keep on going with it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter, or 2 Timothy rather, chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, and look at verse number 5. Paul writes to a young man named Timothy, and he says, thank you kindly. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. What is unfeigned faith? It's genuine faith. Okay, so this genuine faith gets into Timothy somehow. Who put it there? Which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. And tomorrow night we'll talk about grandmas like Lois and thy mother Eunice. And look at it being passed on down like a family heirloom. I'm persuaded it's in you also, Timothy. Now go to chapter 2, if you will. 2 Timothy 2 and look at verse 2. The things that you've heard among me the things you've heard of me among many witnesses, rather. The same, don't change it. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So take what you've been taught and pass it on. Pass it on. What is the reason why we don't use mechanical instruments of music in New Testament worship? Why do we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Acts 20 and verse 7. Why do we sing and make melody in our hearts, but not on any other instrument? Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. What, what passages would you go to to prove that you really do need to be baptized to be saved and not say a sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart as if that's the way? Well, Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And I remember my mother teaching me the next thing I'm about to tell you, and she's not the only one that taught a child this, so I know some of you will remember learning it from your folks or someone like them. Someone might say to you, son, well, it doesn't say he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned. So some people might conclude from that that being baptized is not as big a deal as believing, but really the reason why he says he that believeth not shall be damned and not that he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned is the same reason it doesn't say he that believeth not and 
confesseth not and repenteth not and is baptized not shall be damned. If you're not a believer, that's sufficient to damn you no matter what else you do or don't do. And then she gave me this illustration. Tell me, did the instruction of my mother, who's now passed on to her reward, does it still reverberate inside of this mind of mine? Yes, it does. And she said, if someone says, he that eats and his food and digests it shall live, but he that doesn't eat shall die. What if someone said, but you didn't say, he that eats not his food and digests not his food shall die. Well, why would you have to say that? Because if you don't eat, there's no possibility of digestion. Not eating is enough to kill you. The lack of digestion is uh, not the most important thing at this point because you don't even have the prerequisite thing. You have to eat before you can digest food. You have to believe before you can be baptized, but they're both necessary if you're going to be saved. I also very vividly remember this statement from my mother that she made. And she said, sometimes, son, the simplest answer is the best answer. And people look for complications and oh, they, they, want to, they want to try all these things. You know what? I've thought about, I've been preaching for since full time since 1983. So, let me tell you the number of times anyone has ever approached me and said, Preacher, I do not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I was wondering when you could find time to baptize me. I've never had that happen. Because if you don't believe, you won't care about being baptized. It takes more than one condition to save, but... One condition of unbelief is enough to damn you. And we need to take things that we've been taught by our parents, grandparents. And what, what does Timothy then get told in 2 Timothy 3? He says in verse 14, continue. Oh, here we go. This is the Proverbs 4 model. Get the good teaching and then hold it fast and continue in it. Don't walk away from it. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. If you're here tonight and you are privileged to be raised in a home where you were taught this book from the time you were small, oh, how blessed you are. Now what? The job's not done. I like what the little boy said to his dad when the sermon was concluded. Little child says, is it over? Does that mean it's over? And the father wisely said, actually it means it's just begun. Now we've got to go live it. It's not just preaching a sermon in the four walls of a church building and walking away. It is doing what we have been taught to do and never departing from it. So as we close out, let me say a word to you children and to this child here about what to do when mom and dad get older. And we're talking about perhaps to a point where they just cannot take care of themselves anymore by themselves. Now, it's not pleasant to think of that day my dad lives with my wife and with me at our home, and we view him as a member of the family, and I certainly do not begrudge his presence. I can tell you that every now and then he will say, I feel so helpless, I can't even do for you the things that I want to do to, to thank you for letting me live here, to thank you for feeding me, to thank you for all, the, and I said, Dad, I've got a lot of catching up to do. You took care of me from the time I was a small baby until the time I left home. And even after that, you were available for me when I needed you. Uh, you don't owe me anything. I'm trying to pay you back what you've given me, and I'm way behind, way behind. 
young people, please know that your moms and your dads may get to a point where they need tender, loving care and not resentment and not you're such an inconvenience. And people don't say those words out loud, but if they act put out in front of the one they're trying to give care to, then that can certainly send the wrong message. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. According to Almighty God, you and I have the privilege and the responsibility of providing for our parents even in their older years. Now, I'm going to be the first one to say as I stand here, having watched my dad take care of my grandmother in the years after she got Parkinson's and dementia, I know it was challenging for him and for my mom. And she would sometimes say things that she would never have said when she was not yet sick. And sometimes... The person who's the caregiver receives all kinds of statements that are demanding and sometimes demeaning. They don't necessarily even know that they're being that way. And so you have to have thick enough skin to be able to say, I'm going to do my job, even though sometimes it's difficult to do. I'm going to take care of my mom or dad and get them the best care available. If that care is available at home, fantastic. If it's not available at home but can be provided nearby in a facility that allows for them to be even given better care than you're capable of giving because of certain circumstances, that's obviously a family issue. But the number one thing is that we do what needs to be done to take care of mom and dad. Because believe it or not, young people, I used to be your age. And the snow is now on the mountain in whiter amounts than it used to be. And I can tell you something, young people. Some of the older folks in this building right now are listening to me saying, you're young. And you know they're right. But this is as old as I've ever been. So I'm trying to get used to this age for me. But I'm telling you, turn around three times, you're going to be the little lady with the white hair. You're going to be the man who doesn't stand as upright as he used to stand because he, his body just won't let him. And so what's the number one thing God wants from you children? He wants from you, he wants from this child. The ability to live a life that would cause our mom and dads to say, our moms and dads to say, I'm so glad that I was able to teach you about Jesus in this wonderful place called heaven and the church that he bought. It would be a thrill tonight to see someone become a member of that blood-bought church by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins as the book of Acts teaches so clearly. It would also be a wonderful thing tonight to see a prodigal come home and to say, I've been in the far country and it was my decision. I need to go home. My father will, he, he will at least bless me with the things that I need, though I don't deserve them. Fathers want to bless their children. And the story of the prodigal son gives us hope because it shows the parents in pain that sometimes even though you may have looked at that horizon for years, thinking, hoping, praying that just maybe this is the day that the figure of my son starts coming back toward the family instead of walking away from the family, maybe one day you're going to look up there and say, wait a minute, that, that looks like my son. That is my son. And you'll run. 
I don't think that I ever thought about this in my youth when I preached on Luke 15. The father ran. Do you know the last time I saw my dad run anywhere? He's 84 now. 83, actually. And he can't run. For him to run would really be saying something. God would run to meet you tonight if you're wayward and wandering. Child of God, please, don't lose your soul. Don't walk away from good teaching you've received. Or maybe the good teaching you've received has brought you to the point where you're ready to become a child of God by obeying the gospel. Whatever your situation, this is your hour, your moment, your chance. Won't you come as together we stand and sing, won't you please? Thank you.